This scrap of paradise known as Cape Breton was sighted by John Cabot in 1497, only five years after Christopher Columbus made his first landfall in the Americas. Claimed by the French as part of Acadia, it became British after the fall of Louisbourg. Today, Cape Breton Highlands National Park preserves some of the landscape that two displaced peoples found here, the Scots and the Acadians. One of the most scenic areas in the Atlantic provinces, the northern part of Cape Breton Island, is best known perhaps for this panoramic highway that runs around its outer edges. The highway, the Cabot Trail, encloses Cape Breton Highlands National Park, remarkable for its geological, biological, and cultural diversity. In the age of the automobile, however, the Cabot Trail often overshadows the park itself. The highway and the park are among the major tourist attractions in eastern Canada. The park's 958 square kilometers offer impressive variety. The Gulf of St. Lawrence to the west, the Acadian forest that grows in the valleys of its interior, and the Atlantic Ocean to the east. For the people who lived along this rugged coastline, the construction of the first Cabot Trail in 1932 meant profound change. But when Cape Breton Highlands National Park was created in 1936, it was decided that the steep, bone-jarring road was not up to National Park standards, and reconstruction began immediately. Everything used to come here by steamer before. If you wanted to go anywhere, you went on the steamer passenger steamer and freight boat combined. Now you don't have to worry. You jump in your car, away you go. Willard Hinckley, now retired, was 15 years old when he worked on the Cabot Trail. As a water boy, he was paid what then seemed like the princely sum of $2 a day. It took four years to rebuild the old road. There was a lot of work, you know, a lot of they had camps on the mountain here with people coming in to work and they, uh, widened out the roads and making picnic grounds, parking lots. It was a big thing for this end of the country, the National Park. The Cabot Trail, on which Willard Hinckley worked out his teens, however, was still a far cry from the road we know today. The paving of the road didn't begin until 1958, and now the scenery attracts hundreds of thousands of people a year. Many of the breathtaking vistas were caused by the shifting of vast continental plates. Geologist Sandra Barr is in no doubt about the role that thrusting rock has played in creating the scenery. The geology controls the scenery, yes, and uh, I would uh, think that uh, we could say that the geology is the story behind the scenery. I've noticed in mapping here that when I'm working on areas underlain by granite, the trees are much more likely to be hardwood trees, whereas the areas underlain by volcanic rocks, for example, the uh, trees are more likely to be spruce and other types of softwood. So there's a very direct relationship between uh, what can grow where and what kinds of rocks are under there. Sandra Barr has been studying Cape Breton's geological origins for 10 years and has discovered that the island was the scene of a major collision between continents. Little of this was understood before she began her research. The granite that forms the cliff is part of a big unit called the Chetacamp Pluton. It's about 550 million years old. We know that because we've determined the age of zircon crystals within the Pluton by the uranium lead dating method. Cape Breton's a very complicated place, and when Africa, South America, 
and other continents collided with North America, uh, pieces got pasted on or amalgamated against North America, but because North America had a promontory, things were very compressed in this particular area. People didn't realize that there were actually billion-year-old rocks in the northernmost part of Cape Breton Island, equivalent to the ones in Grossmorn in Newfoundland. So in those areas, you see basically the same rocks that we see in Cape Breton, but they're spread out over a larger distance. Here, they've been intensely compressed together. Sandra told us it wasn't a sudden collision of tectonic plates that caused this upthrust. It began 420 million years ago and went on for 120 million years. We had no idea of any of that when we started. So it's been, it's been really exciting to, to work it all out. And it's come together like blocks in a puzzle, you know. Each summer of mapping added a new piece. And I guess it all came together for us about 1990, about halfway through the work. But then we had to prove it. I always like to uh, impress upon people that within Cape Breton Island, you can drive on rocks that probably came from three or different continents originally. And you can do that all within, uh, within a few hours driving. I think it's very unique. I don't know any other place that's quite as as spectacular in that respect. Alexander Graham Bell, the great Scottish-born inventor who died at his Cape Breton home in 1922, felt very strongly about this island. I have seen the Canadian and American Rockies, he once wrote, the Andes and the Alps and the Highlands of Scotland. But for simple beauty, Cape Breton outrivals them all. The park was designed for the Cabot Trail, for the automobile to come around and uh, you stop every now and then, enjoy the scenery, take a picture, go for a little walk, have a picnic, catch a fish, get back in your car and continue the tour. Nowadays, we're getting a lot more requests for people that want to hike from place to place and, and spend more time getting to know the, the park and the wilderness here more intimately. Some of the things that uh, people miss by uh, staying on the Cabot Trail is how the scenery can make you feel. Uh, they'll stop at a look-off and take the picture and if you start to stay at one of our look-offs for any length of time, after a while you start to feel sort of small. And, and people sometimes find that frightening, like, my goodness, I'm, this place is starting to feel overwhelming. And they get right back in their car and turn on the radio and drive some more. When you experience the park on your own foot, just going where your heart tells you to go, then you really feel what this place is all about and what it means to you. Dave knew just the place to show us what he meant about getting out of the car and walking. Grand Ants Valley contains 1,500 hectares of old growth forest. The oldest trees in here around 400 years, and in the canopy, the predominant trees are around 200, 300 years old. And this is the, in the whole world, this is the largest protected tract of this kind of forest. And what is an Acadian old growth forest? I mean, what kind of trees and yeah. growth does that involve? Well, the hardwood forests, you know, extend from, you know, southern Canada, Ontario and Quebec and New England states up to here. And in the Maritimes, uh, the mixture is very much sugar maple with some uh, red oak and a lot of yellow birch and some beech. And that uh, mixture of trees is what's referred to as the Acadian uh, hardwood forest. So this is, would include some very old trees, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. In this, in this forest here, there, there are trees that are 400 years old. And most of the large trees that we see here in the uh, canopy making up the uh, forest are uh, over 200, 300 years old. And it took uh, 10,000 years of uh, generations of this forest to produce the type of forest that uh, we're enjoying today. You say it took 10,000 years. Why, why so long? Well, the, uh, the glaciers uh, cleaned everything off. And then when they melted back 10,000 years, it was just bare ground here. And uh, 